everyone. Today I am talking about my internship that I had over the summer. Some of you have probably heard me talk about it and I promised I would share more about it on this channel so that's what I am going to do. So the organization that I did my archaeology internship with is one that I've worked with a lot in the past. I was first introduced to them when my dad took my sister and me to a day trip when I was in middle school and that's when I found out about their summer programs. They're really focused on education so they have a lot of programs for people of all ages and I did their one week high school camp and I did their three week high school field school and that field school is actually what got me to add anthropology as a major instead of just being my minor so I double majored in English and anthropology for a while and then I ended up dropping English to a minor, keeping anthropology as my major. So that field school is the reason I majored in what I did. And then once I was far enough along in my studies, I applied for the college internship. And unfortunately it was canceled due to the pandemic. So I applied again this year and I obviously got it. Getting this internship was a huge honor it is incredibly competitive. So last year, I think there were about 70 applicants, and this year there were over 120, and there are only four spots, and I got one of the spots. So I feel really honored to be one of the people who got to do that, and I'm just also really honored to work with the amazing people that run this organization because the archeologists there are really kind-hearted, they're really knowledgeable, and I really like what this organization stands for and I enjoy working with them and so it was just a huge honor to be able to do that and I'm really grateful that that happened. So the internship was located in Southwest Colorado and I got to see amazing views of the Mesa Verde Escarpment, Sleeping Ute Mountain, the La Plata Mountains every day. I was surrounded by pinyon juniper woodland a lot of time. I also spent a lot of time around sagebrush fields and those are two of my favorite types of ecosystems so that was really cool. There are marmots that live on campus so I got to see the marmots quite a bit which is always really fun and this is just my favorite place in the whole world is southwest Colorado and so I really enjoyed getting to spend my entire summer there. That was really awesome. While they have housing on campus for the interns. I chose not to use it. Instead, as you probably know if you've seen some of my videos, I decided to stay in an RV instead. And this RV was on property owned by family members and I did this so that I could have more privacy, spend time with my family, and also have my guinea pigs with me. And unfortunately it was often too hot for the guinea pigs to safely stay with me so they stayed with me for five weeks and they stayed with my parents for the other five weeks and my parents don't live horribly far away so it wasn't too hard to do that but I didn't really get to see them at all during those five weeks and that was hard because Salem was in really poor health and Leia just hates being away from me she gets really really clingy after I leave her for a while so it wasn't the ideal situation but it was definitely better than them dying of heat stroke while I'm at work because it just got too hot in the RV and we tried fans and coolers and everything and could not get it to stay cold enough for them so we tried but it just didn't really work out but I was glad to have them for at least half the internship that was better than nothing then on campus we would be there for about eight hours a day working and then I also ate there because they provided food and the cooks were really nice and they were pretty good about accommodating my dietary restrictions which was super awesome and I definitely can't complain about not having to cook. We did have to make our own lunches just because it was too confusing for them to remember which days were in the field and which days were not and our schedule was constantly changing so we made our own lunches but Having a big hot breakfast and a nice home cooked dinner every day was really nice and it was free food and we got that for the first seven weeks and then the last three weeks we had a stipend that we could use to buy our own food and so I just did that and 
eight with my family. And then we also got paid, which is really awesome. Most internships aren't paid. It's really hard to find paid ones and paycheck makes a huge difference. So I was really grateful to have that as well. So that's all the boring context, I guess, of the internship. And now I will get into what I actually did as part of the internship. So last year and in other years previous, the internship was divided into two. So there was a lab internship and a field internship. So you do one or the other. Last year, I had a really hard time deciding and applied for both. And lab is my preference. So that was the one that I ended up going with last year. But this year they decided to combine the two, which fixed my problem. So I actually got to do both field and lab work and they added a little bit of education and American Indian initiatives as well. So I got to do a little bit of everything rather than just doing lab work. So in the field, we helped excavate an ancestral Pueblo site that is nearby and it's really important because it has two great houses on it and that's a direct connection to Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. And it also appears to have been occupied during the 8900s and archeologists really don't know much about the archeology span of that particular century. And so this site has the potential to fill a gap in our knowledge, which is really cool. So a crash course, for those of you who don't know who the Ancestral Pueblo are, they are a group of people who lived in the Four Corners region from about 500 BC to AD 1350. They were originally nomadic hunter-gatherers, but by about 500 BC, their culture had really changed a lot because maize or corn agriculture had been introduced, and so they switched from being hunter-gatherers to farmers. And during this time, they were living in semi-subterranean structures called pit houses. And then over time, they moved into above ground room blocks. And these are like the really famous cliff dwellings from Mesa Verde National Park, if you're familiar with those. And then around 1300s, they started migrating out of the region. And their descendants are the modern Pueblo people who live in New Mexico and Arizona, particularly along the Rio Grande River. And then part of that is Chaco Canyon. And it was the political center during like the 1000s and 1100s. And you can see evidence of the relationship with Chaco in the architecture. And that's where you get great houses and great kivas. And great houses are just like really big, fancy room blocks that have Chaco and style architecture a lot of time. And great kivas are really big round kivas. And kivas are almost always subterranean structures. And they're used for like communal activities and gathering. So that's kind of the crash course. So in the field, in addition to helping the college field school students excavate, each intern had their own unit that they excavated. So mine was a four foot deep trench and we believe it was through a kiva. Obviously we won't know everything for sure until it's done being excavated and analyzed, but we believe it's a kiva and my job basically was to find the floor so I was excavating down trying to find the floor and I found some pretty cool stuff while I was excavating like an elk tooth uh, matate which is a large slab of rock that they would like grind corn on. I found a disc bead, a ladle, which not the whole ladle, part of the ladle and part of its handle which was pretty cool. I found a little teeny tiny projectile point that had been turned into a drill found several bone tools and I found a pretty decently sized chunk of burned wood that still had bark on it which is super cool and we can actually date that using dendrochronology so that was an interesting find and then I also found a ceramic bowl that appears to be on the floor and it had a little modified flake in it so that was pretty exciting too I didn't get to fully excavate the bowl because we didn't get that far down, but I did find it and it will get excavated eventually. I also had to evict a lot of little critters from the trench. Um, I had to evict a snake, a little baby snake. 
it was not happy about me chasing it with a shovel, but I eventually got it to get on the shovel and I relocated it. I had to evict a salamander, which I was not expecting to find in there, but there was a salamander in there. And then there's this cute little vole that had a hole in the corner of the trench that it came out of. And we had a metal probe sitting in the trench and it came up and started chewing on the probe. And I was just like sitting there excavating, not even like two feet away from it. And it didn't seem to mind me even when I got up and started moving toward it. And I had to block its hole and use my trowel to gently knock it into a bucket so that we could rehome it because I could not have a vole living in my trench. So we had to evict some animals and that was kind of interesting and fun. So, And then you're probably wondering, did I or did I not get to the floor? So we dug a test window to see where the floor was to see how close I was. And it turns out there were actually two floors and the upper one was not well preserved all the way through the unit and so I dug through it because we thought it was just a natural silt deposit and it wasn't until I found the hearth that we realized something was off because the hearth was way too high to be associated with the floor that I was looking for so turns out there was an upper floor and that silt deposit was that floor so fortunately I did take notes of the silt deposit so we sort of know where it was and mistakes like that happen it's unfortunate but that that's what happened so we didn't make it all the way down to the lower floor because we ended up having to do all this stuff with the upper floor once we figured out there was an upper floor and we also couldn't excavate once we found the hearth because we had to have a specialist come in and do some work with the hearth before we could excavate through it and she wasn't available to come in until after I left so we had to stop excavation at that point because there was nothing else we could do until the hearth could be excavated through and we also really couldn't excavate a whole lot anyway because monsoon season hit it rained a ton and the trench got flooded several times so that's why there was a salamander in there so it was really hard to excavate and you can't really excavate safely in a muddy unit because you can't tell the difference between the different levels so if i had gotten to the floor i would not have recognized it as a floor because everything's so muddy and you can't see well enough and it just messes everything up so I didn't get to the floor myself, they'll get to the floor eventually, and I'm excited to see what they find down there. Then in the lab, I helped catalog, which is where we take the artifacts that have been brought in from the field, and we sort them and record them and enter them into the database. I helped analyze different things like pottery, chipstone, groundstone, ornaments, and heavy fraction. Heavy fraction is when you take a soil sample from the field and you take it into the lab and wash all the dirt off and soak it in water until all the light stuff floats to the top, which is the light fraction, and all the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom, that's the heavy fraction. Then we take the heavy fraction and we sort it with tweezers and look for artifacts, really small artifacts generally, and then also things like bone or seeds that might be useful and I was the lucky intern who found a disc bead in the heavy fraction that's a lot of times what you find in heavy fraction is little tiny beads and I found one and then we also did some experimental archaeology where we went onto the neighbor's property with permission and collected natural clay and processed it and made our own vessels and decorated them and fired them we wanted to do a traditional firing, but there was a burn ban, so we had to use an electric kiln. But we went through as much of the process the way the Ancestral Pueblo did as we could, and then we had to fire it normally. So that was cool getting to do that. And then I'm going to talk a lot about chipstone analysis because that was my special project. I want to specialize in lithic analysis, which is the study of stone tools and the production process in terms of making them. And there's groundstone and chipstone. Groundstone 
are the things that you would grind on. Like if you are grinding corn or if you have a square stone that you're trying to round to make a bead, that would be ground stone tools. And then a chipstone tool is when you have a rock, which is called a core, and then you take a hammer stone and you hit it and knock flakes off. And then you either continue hitting the core or you take one of the larger flakes and start hitting it with the hammer stone and then eventually antler when you're working on smaller stuff to shape it into a formal tool such as a knife or some sort of blade, a projectile point, a drill, something like that. That's the chipstone tool. So the organization needed help analyzing all their bulk chipstone, which is all the debitage, so all the flakes and the other things that come off during the process, not the formal tools, all those needed to be analyzed. And no one's really interested in analyzing that. Most people ooh and ah over the pottery and want to help with the pottery, but I like lithics, so I offered to help with the chipstone. So with that, I have to sort all the debitage by material. So there's different types of chert, different types of silicified sandstone, there's obsidian, there's jasper, there's petrified wood, there's chalcedony, all sorts of different things. So I have to sort them based on that, and then I have to sort them again based on whether or not they have cortex, which is like the outer piece of the rock, because that tells whether or not the piece of debitage is from the outside or the inside of the rock and helps us better understand the production process. So I have to do all of that. And then from there, I write tags for each of the groups and then I size sort them. So the bigger ones, the medium ones, the little ones, we have screens that we put them through so it's objective. And then I have to weigh all of the different size classes. And I have a master sheet where I write all this stuff down and it gets put into the database. And I think I analyzed about 5,000 pieces of debitage over the course of the internship. And basically my goal was to get a better grasp of the material types, which is why I focus so much on the debitage and not the formal tools. And my accuracy went from about 70% to about as high as it can get. So that was really great getting to really focus on the material types and hone in on learning those. And that I feel was really rewarding and helpful and made the whole internship, like if you just forget everything else, that thing alone made the internship definitely worth doing. So I was really grateful to be able to do that and I got to work really closely with a really nice analyst who specializes also in lithics. That's her favorite thing and I got to learn a lot from her and that was really cool. Then with education, we had two education days or I had two education days. We kind of mixed it up where people did different things on different days. I spent a lot of those flexible days in the lab working on chipstone, but I had two education days. And on those days we went to Mesa Verde National Park and we would set up a table and put replica artifacts on it and talk to visitors and answer their questions. And we did this primarily because the museum is closed for refurbishment right now. And so a lot of people wanted to see artifacts and learn more about the archeology span of the area. And we were able to provide that to visitors who were there on the days that we were. And I really like engaging with the public and talking to people about archeology. span So I thought those days were really fun and rewarding. And then the first day we were out there, there was this five-year-old who came up and like schooled us because he knows more about rocks and flint napping and bison kills than we do, which was pretty funny. So don't say kids aren't smart. This five-year-old like totally schooled us. It was really funny. We also had a few days with the American Indian Initiatives Department. And on those days, we went to Ute Mountain Ute Reservation with a member of the tribe who works for the organization and we also went to the Ute Tribal Park and got to see rock art and archaeological sites out there that aren't usually open to the public so that was a really cool opportunity to get to see things that people don't normally get to see like a lot of the people who work for that organization have never seen these sites and the interns got really lucky and got to go see these sites so that was really cool. And then we also had some field trips. So our first field trip was to the site across the street from the one we were excavating. And that's a really cool site that is like really well preserved and there's some interesting stuff happening over there. And I actually got to go over there twice. I went 
really early on and then I went like the very last day of the internship and then we also went to Edge of the Cedars State Park and Museum in Blanding, Utah which is my favorite museum and I was super excited to go back there and then we went to Chaco Canyon for a weekend. This is my fourth time going to Chaco Canyon, so I got to see some familiar sights. And then we also went out into the back country with a prominent archaeologist of the region and got to help her do some survey on some Navajo sites. So that was really awesome and a once in a lifetime opportunity. And then we got to tour Fuchs Canyon at Mesa Verde which is not typically open to the public, and somehow we managed to get a guided tour into Fuchs Canyon, so that included sites like Mummy House, Oak Tree House, Fire Temple, and New Fire House. So that was really cool. And then the day after that, we went to Aztec, and we got to see Aztec North. The one that's open to the public is Aztec West. So again, we got to go behind the scenes and see stuff that people usually don't get to see. And we went with an archeologist who did her dissertation work at Aztec North. So that was really cool too. And as I was doing this internship, I realized it is a really small world. There were some weird things that happened. So some of the people I worked with are friends with my family members and I didn't know that. And then when I was at Mesa Verde, I ran into three people that I know, two of which went to college with me. And then when we were at Edge of the Cedars, the intern there was someone I went to school with. And then I also just ran into someone I went to school with on campus where I was working. And she knows who I am because she did all the marketing for my honors thesis presentation. So that was weird. And then I also met one of my coworkers, and he's in my cohort for grad school. So we obviously got to know each other and we're friends now. And then there was one other thing that happened that isn't part of the internship, but something I did over the summer. My grad school advisor was working in Southeast Utah, pretty close by. And so he was able to come over and go out to the site that my grandpa owns and tour that with us and that's because I'm going to do my master's thesis work on that site and so it was good for him to get to see that and then he's also my friend's advisor so we went out to my friend's site that he's going to be researching and did that and then I had some paid time off that I hadn't used so I took a day off and went and worked with my advisor in Utah for a day and got to help out at a cool site there so that was really fun too. And yeah, I got to spend my summer doing really cool things. I got to live my dream of doing archeology span in Southwest Colorado for a whole 10 weeks. And I'm really excited to get out there and do that again in the future. And I learned a lot of important skills and information. I got to work some with, I got to work with some really amazing people and I got to explore some sites, some of which I will probably never get to see again, and that was a really awesome once in a lifetime opportunity to get to see those things. And I'm sure you're probably interested in pictures, and I posted a lot of them on Instagram, so you can check out my Instagram account if you wanna see those. I think I have a highlight section that's for archaeology and I think all my posts that have those pictures are in that highlights section. I think there's one thing that I haven't posted any pictures of yet but I can probably do that in the near future. So if you want to see pictures you can check that out. And yeah that's what I have. If you're interested in this archaeology stuff let me know in the comments because I've been thinking about talking about it more on this channel. I've been thinking about maybe doing like creative nonfiction with it or something. Like I don't know if that's something anyone is interested in or not. Let me know in the comments so I can find out if anyone is interested in that. And that's all I have for you today. That's my internship that I had over the summer. So I hope you all have an amazing day.